Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And this is lesson number seven in that series for November 16 of 2019, entitled, Our Forgiving God. Boy, is that ever a truth or whatever. So we'll have a great time with this one together, I'm sure. But we always, as, as you know, begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow here recognizing your presence and your guidance and studying your word. May we come to understand it better and understand you better is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In our last lesson, we talked about Nehemiah 8. We learned about a tremendous effect that had on those people who had returned from Babylonian captivity just by the reading of God's Word. Now, it wasn't just the ordinary reading of God's Word because in those days, God's Word was in Hebrew and the people no longer spoke Hebrew, they spoke Aramaic. So, as Ezra read from the Hebrew, he had some experts there translating the Aramaic and so those people heard the verbal the very first verbal, we would call it a modern language translation. And the people drank it in. They wept when they heard God's word because the book of Deuteronomy, which is probably what they were reading from, had predicted so precisely all the problems they would have. And they, How could we not have known that when God made it so clear back in the beginning? So that's our, our background in Nehemiah 8. We now come to Nehemiah 9. This will be our, our cover for this lesson by, mostly. It's a direct follow-up from what happened in Nehemiah 8. When the children of Israel understand, understood, these, these returnees understood how far they had wandered away from God's plan for their lives, they wept. In this chapter, we'll find that they offered a prayer to God, recounting God's goodness their own sinfulness and the sinfulness of their fathers. And then they had it written and they signed it as a contract with God. We're going to look at that chapter 9 just briefly in outline. I think, Carrie, you can do that for us. Yes. A short structure of Nehemiah 9 would look something like this. The people read from the book of the law, Nehemiah 9, 1 to 3. Prayer of Confession, Nehemiah 9, 4 to 38. One, Praising God, Nehemiah 9, 4 to 8. Two, God's faithfulness in spite of Israel's unfaithfulness in Egypt and in the wilderness, Nehemiah 9, 9 through 22. God's goodness in spite of Israel's unfaithfulness in the land of Canaan. That's Nehemiah 9, 23 through 31. For praising and petitioning God, Nehemiah 9, 32 to 38, that comes from Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Very good. So after this weeping, you can sort of follow, think about the sequence here. They hear the word of God. They realize how far they and their ancestors have fallen short of that original word of God. And they wept. And then they said, well, praise God because of his creation. And down, they, they sort of worked their way down through history and said, we now understand how far we've wandered away from God's will. And we understand where we are. And God, please help us. But Nehemiah and Ezra spoke up and said, this isn't a time for weeping. This is a time for celebrating. Now, why would they say that? Anybody? The wall was kind of topped it off. Wall was done. Yeah, it, 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 the fact that they responded so yeah. remarkably yes. to the reading of God's word, that's a reason to celebrate. Absolutely. Now, Christians, you know, we usually think, well, you, you, you need to confess first and get your sins forgiven, and then if you're after you're sure you're right with God, then you can celebrate. But we need to remember a very important verse found in Romans 2, verse 4, that says, Or perhaps you despise his great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent. 
So God's kindness is supposed to lead us to what? Repentance. Repentance. So we see God's kindness first. And, and these people, don't you suspect that they realized, through that, all that experience, realized God's kindness. And that was part of their response. It's certainly appropriate to praise God and to feast when thinking of his goodness. But we must not forget that we need his forgiveness, his cleansing, and his renewal. Margaret, I think you have some words. This is from Nehemiah 9, verses 1 to 3. On the 24th day of the same month, the people of Israel assembled to fast in order to show sorrow for their sins. They had already separated themselves from all foreigners. They wore sackcloth and put dust on their heads as signs of grief. Can I interrupt for just a second? Can you imagine what would happen if um, the university church here, everybody came to celebrate a very special occasion to the university church wearing sackcloth with dust on their heads? Yeah. <laughs> Cultural times have changed, yeah. right? Yeah. That would make the news now. <laughs> it would make the news. Somewhere. Sorry, go ahead. Anyway, then they stood and began to confess the sins that they and their ancestors had committed. For about three hours, the law of the Lord their God was read to them. And for the next three hours, they confessed their sins and worshipped the Lord their God. This was taken from the American Bible Society, the Good News Bible, Good News Translation. Okay, so now the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar is a very special month. What happens during those seven months? Do you remember during the seventh month? Day of Atonement. Okay, that's right in the middle. There's the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Booths. Okay? So there's three big celebrations in that month. So you can see that they are, they're beginning to understand all that and, and, and seeing how they can participate in all that. But this, uh, this sin is entirely different from when the Lord gave them the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. We will give, we'll keep them, we will keep them. But here they're renting their hearts, really. Mm -hmm. And says, yeah. we have made mistakes. We're coming back home. Yeah. So now, they separated themselves from the foreigners among them because they recognized their sinfulness uh, this, and the sinfulness of their ancestors did not involve the foreigners. So they're saying, we can't ask the foreigners who live among us to come and confess their sins. They weren't involved. On that occasion, they came together recognizing their own sinfulness and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads as a sign of their grief. After hearing the law of God read for about three hours, they began to confess their sins. And Jim? There's a note from November 10, I believe it was Sunday, out of our lesson guide. It says, Their corporate prayers and confession demonstrated a deep understanding of the nature of sin. The Israelites could have been angry that their predecessors messed up and led their whole nation into exile. Or they could have spent time complaining about the choices of their leaders and the lack of godliness displayed by the previous generations, <clears throat> which had led them to where they were right now, just a small group of returnees. However, instead of harboring hatred and grievances, they turn to God in humility and confession. And we should say, Amen. 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 Yeah, Amen. That was marvelous. By the way, approximately what percentage of the Jews returned home? Anybody know? We don't know for sure, but it's estimated no more than 1 or 2%. Oh, really? I was going to say 5%, but not even that. Not even that. That's oh, right. Boy. We weren't so, there. We didn't count. Our <laughs> yeah. So they were very uh, comfortable. And, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they were well established. They were comfortable. We're not going back. Yep. Well, most of them had probably been born in Babylon. Yeah, exactly. So do, do, do you have any historical... They to go back, isn't it? When you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, they did not, They were comfortable. You see, the government was good. So what has happened to them through the years, though? Yeah, exactly. Well, what we are, what we learn from later lessons, I will tell you, in later parts of Nehemiah is, well, not from later parts of Nehemiah, but from records that have been dug up in Mesopotamia, a number of them have become very successful businessmen over in Mesopotamia. And if they went back to Jerusalem, of course, they would lose that, that business. 
Well, there were a lot of them there up until the time of the Gulf yeah. War. In fact, yes. it was, I don't know how many Christians in Mosul, uh, thousands, yeah. thousands. Now it's down to 40. Yeah. And we, right. uh, wars are just... Well, uh, not only that, but what about the Jews? Well, same. The number... Uh, probably not the same numbers, but... Uh, we're going to... We're gonna, you'll see. We've got some lessons come up. Get, talk, we'll talk about the incredible number of Jews who used to live in these countries that are basically all gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I need to ask a disturbing question right now. What kind of effect would it have on members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, your church in 2019, if a portion of Scripture was read in a formal ceremony for three hours? <laughs> I would hope that people would weep. Would it make a difference what portion of Scripture was chosen? Yes, it yes. would. Definitely. Would yes. make a How difference? many would fall asleep? That's what I was going to say. Well, migrate out the door. Yeah. Well, there's a very interesting prayer that fits pretty closely with this uh, thing. It's found in Daniel 9, 4 through 19. We're not going to take time to read that whole prayer. We'll look at part of it in a moment. In this fantastic prayer, Daniel recognized that his people had sinned and that they deserved what had happened to them. So that's more or less what these people are now recognizing, right? Mm -hmm. He did not separate himself from the rest of the people, even though he himself was, a pro was probably much less guilty. And he spoke to God as one might speak to a friend. And, of course, that reminds us of John fifteen fifteen, where it says, I do not call you, Jesus to his disciples, I do not call you servants any longer, because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends, because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. So let me um, sort of paraphrase Daniel's last part of Daniel's prayer and see what you hear. Then Daniel concluded his prayer by making a powerful argument to God. He essentially said, your people God who used to worship in your temple which has now been destroyed are looking down on, uh, looked down on because your city and your sacred hill are in ruins. What do you think Daniel's trying to say here? You promised that you would restore your people after 70 years. That time is near. We are not claiming that you should do something because we have done right. Instead, because you are so merciful. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act. In order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. What's happening here in Daniel's prayer? Well, he's laying it all before God. Yes. God, please act. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he's doing something else. He's saying, Lord, what really matters now, the bottom line here is your reputation. Yeah. What matters, and this is absolutely essential to our understanding of, of the great controversy and the plan of salvation. God's reputation should be more important to us than our own salvation. Amen. That's a that's a amazing people you know most people think that you know salvation the plan of salvation is all about well it, it's about my salvation and and yours too of course but you know it's all about me and, and you that's what salvation is about no sal the real plan of salvation the great controversy is about god and how he has won the war against the devil and the devil's selfish attitudes and all that kind of stuff so this is a very important passage in our understanding of the great controversy well, how often do, you, do we pray about God's reputation? How often do we act in ways to correctly represent Him? Well, I think we pray every day that we may rightly represent His kingdom. I certainly hope so. Yeah, yeah I certainly hope so. Well, after hearing the scripture read, the people in Nehemiah's day responded with a fairly lengthy prayer to God. They were led in that prayer by the Levites, who are named specifically and who encourage them to stand up and praise the Lord their God. Now, why do you suppose in the limited amount of space that we have available to us in Scripture, we would want to list the names of those who did the reading? Do we need to know those names? It sort of validates that this is a historical document, that mm -hmm. it's not just 
some fanciful story. Exactly. Why would you write a novel and then take up several pages listing people's names? Yeah. <laughs> and now, this your, is real. Yeah. Ezra's trying to say to us, look, here are the people who are involved. And it's very common in Scripture for them to not mm -hmm. just say a person's name, but the son of so-and-so, and he's the son of so-and-so. Uh, so the genealogies were very important to them. And these Levites said, please stand up and praise the Lord our God. They recognized the worthiness of God. The children of Israel had come back to Palestine. Their, pr their prayer was, you, Lord, you alone are Lord, Nehemiah 9.6. 6. Then their prayer turned back to recognizing, first of all, that God is our creator. That is always an appropriate uh, way to begin a prayer to God. Then they praised God for choosing Abraham and giving them the land formerly belonging to the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Perizzites, and the Girgashites. They praised God for choosing Abraham and giving him that land. And then we come to Nehemiah 9. There was a platform for the Levites, and on it stood Joshua, Bani, Kadamil, Shebaniah, sorry about these names, Bunny, Sherebiah, Bani, and Shanana. They prayed aloud to the Lord their God. The following Levites gave a call to worship. Joshua, Kadmil, Bani, Hashabini, Sherebah, Hodiah, Shebaniah and Bethahaha. Good work, Jackie. Boy. <laughs> and they said, Stand up and praise the Lord your God. Praise Him forever and ever. Let everyone praise His glorious name. Know the worthiness of God, although no human praise is great enough. And then the people of Israel prayed this prayer. You, Lord, you alone are Lord. You made the heavens and the stars of the sky. You made the land and the sea and everything in them. You gave life to all. The heavenly powers bow down and worship you. You, Lord God, chose Abram and led him out of Ur in Babylonia. You changed his name to Abraham. You found that he was faithful to you and you made a covenant with him. You promised to give him the land of the Canaanites the land of the Hittites and the Amorites and the land of the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Girgashites to be a land where his descendants would live. You kept your promise because you are faithful. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. I'll throw a little tidbit in here that some people are not aware of. Back in the early 1800s, people, well, there was the French Revolution and there was an attempt to just get rid of God completely and so forth. And then there was, there was the, the, the earth, Lisbon earthquake, 1855, um, 1855, the dark day, and 18, uh, 1755, 18, yeah, 1755, and then 1780 was a dark day and so forth. And people started to say, hey, aren't these things that were predicted in the Bible? And then in 1798, the Pope was taken captive and died in prison. And it looked like the Catholic Church was dying done. Yep. And at that point in time, the Protestants rose up and said, what are we doing about spreading the gospel to the whole world? And there, over the next 40, 50 years, there was a great religious revival. And part of that included the work of the British and Foreign Bible Societies and other Bible Societies that started for the first time to actually translate uh, portions of Scripture and even whole Bibles into languages, for example, the languages of India and China. They had never had a Bibles before. And this was, became a huge new enterprise. Well, what, what's the implications of all that? Well, uh, it, it made people turn to the Bible and, and think, you know, what's going on here? And, and, and maybe we need to go back and look at some of these things that we've been reading about. And, of course, that led up to the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It led up to the, to the rise of evolution and lots of stuff like that. So um, in our day, people are given names, more or less arbitrarily. Whatever the parents choose to call their new, the new life becomes his or her lifelong name. In biblical times, by contrast, people were often given names that represented their characters. 
God's name, which sometimes in modern terms we say Jehovah. Jehovah was never ever God's name. Um, I'm sorry, but that's a, a, a mistake. His real name was Yahweh. His personal name is more or less equivalent to our verb to be. Now that sounds like a funny name. Imagine someone naming someone to be. Well, but let's think about this. That there's, there's no time, there's no past, present, or future in the to be. And there's no past, present, or future in God. It's a little it's like, like the term I am. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. great yeah. I am. Yeah, exactly. I am. And that's, that I am is another translation for this word Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah, exactly. It's a great I am. Um, it, it, it indicates that God is the source of all things. He's the creator. His existence has no known beginning and no known ending. But at the same time, he is a personal God. So, Dennis, you can read us something about that. Colossians 1, 15 to 17 in the Good News Bible. Christ is the invisible likeness of the invisible God. No, the visible likeness. Oh, I'm sorry. He is, Christ is the visible likeness of the invisible God. He is the firstborn Son, superior to all created things. For through him God created everything in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. God created the whole universe through him and for him. Christ existed before all things, and in union with him all things have their proper place. So now let's, let's, let's ask some questions. Occasionally I ask you to think, what would you do if you were the devil? Right now I'm going to ask you, what would you do if you were God? And we need to do this pretty often because it's a, it's a good exercise. We can, we can complain about things we read in the Bible. You know, why did that happen? Why did this happen? Well, we need to ask ourselves, okay, if I were the devil, if I were God, what would I do in that circumstance? So now I'm going to ask you, why did God choose Abraham? Of course, his name was Abram at that point in time. Was it because he had worshipped God, but he was in a, in a culture where there were a lot of idolaters, a lot of pagans, and Even uh, God started. wanted to take him away from that, and that's why he chose. And he he was able to keep his own uh, his relationship with yeah. God still. I didn't finish my thought from a moment ago. Back in those early days when it was the great religious awakening, people from Europe said, where are those old places we read about in the Bible? We don't know where those places are. And so people who were adventuresome went off to the Middle East and started just digging randomly here and there, trying to figure out whatever. And one of those people, way down in the southern part of what would be Iraq today, dug up uh, what looked like an, an ancient city and he was digging around there and he found something that said Ur on it. And he said, I have found the home of Abraham. And that has been called the home, the birthplace of Abraham for years and years. But if you go back and read the Bible carefully, it's on the wrong side of the Euphrates River. It is, yes. And it's at the wrong place relative to Huron, which Abraham moved to. The real place where Abraham came from is in southeastern Turkey. And there's a little place there today called Urfa. Urfa. And those people there will tell you, you go there, this is the place where Abraham was born. So when they, it said Ur of Babylonia made me think of that. Um, it wasn't way down there in the south somewhere. It was, and I might add, very interestingly enough, that Ellen White has it right. Hmm on that point. She she says Abraham crossed the river to get from Urfa to Hur to Huron. Uh, and if he had been if he'd come from the places down in the south, he would have already been on the same side of the river as Huron. So uh, anyway, just a little side it note there. It took them quite a while to find the evidence of the Hittites too, as I remember. Yeah. And they were rather, in that area as well. Yeah. They were yeah. very hard to find. So why did he ask him to leave his homeland and travel to Palestine, the land of those other powerful nations? The prayer of the people of Jerusalem recognized God as creator, preserver, and promise keeper. So God needed to separate Abram and his wife Sarai, and in the back in their original names, 
from their family. If they had not, it's very likely within one or two generations more, there would have been no one. I mean, they were just about, the situation of the world was just about as bad as it was back in the days of Noah. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So he, he went up the tent and uh, looked up in the sky. Yeah. His son comes back and tells his wife, says, uh, you know, this what has happened. Mm-hmm. What did you drink kind of thing? You see, <laughs> you see I mean, so he, he took him tremendous faith to yeah. say, to pack up and we're leaving. What's your problem? You no, know, we are living. God had to see what kind of a character Abraham yeah. was. And we know he wasn't right. perfect, then, but right. we knew Abraham had a lot of courage, yeah. a lot of organizational skills. Yeah. That's what gives us of, hope. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ellen White says that Abraham had a thousand people in his household that he, he educated on a daily basis, teaching people, teaching them about God. Amen. And these are people that joined him because they came to believe in his God. Amazing. Mm. So, the fact that he was willing to sacrifice his one, this is talking about Abraham, the fact that he was willing to sacrifice his one promised miraculous son as a burnt offering as recorded in Genesis 22 suggests that Abraham was ultimately faithful. Faithful. When talking about the heart and the Bible, and it does that often, it is referring to the mind because that's the thinking and action part of the body that God sees in our actions every day. In fact, people who have studied the Bible, the Bible, the body carefully realize that the whole rest of the body is there for one purpose, and that's to carry around and protect the mind, the brain. Well, Seventh-day Adventists that, uh, believe that the teaching about God as creator is very important. We believe the same God who want, wants a personal relationship with us so he asks us to come apart from our weekly activities and worship him one day out of seven. That is a very large commitment. For those who practice it, the Sabbath recognize the important role we believe God plays in our lives every day. So we look at the next section of the prayer, starting with verse 9. You saw how our ancestors suffered in Egypt. You heard their call for help at the Red Sea. You worked amazing miracles against the king, against his officials and the people of his land because you knew how they oppressed your people. You won then the fame you still have today. Through the sea you made a path for your people and led them through on dry ground. Those who pursued them drowned in deep waters as stone sinks on the raging sea. With a cloud you led them in daytime and at night you lighted their way with fire. At Mount Sinai you came down from heaven. You spoke to your people and gave them Uh, good laws and sound teachings. You taught them to keep your Sabbaths holy. And through your servant Moses, you gave them your laws. When they were hungry, you gave them bread from heaven and water from a rock when they were thirsty. You told them to take control of the land which you had promised to give them. But our ancestors grew proud and stubborn and refused to obey your commands. I mean, think about praying this kind of idea. They refused to obey. They forgot all you did. They forgot the miracles you had performed. In their pride, they chose a leader to take them back to slavery in Egypt. But you are God who forgives. You're gracious and loving, slow to be angry. Your mercy is great. You did not forsake them. They made an idol in the shape of a bull calf and said it was the God who led them out from Egypt, led them from Egypt. How much they insulted you, Lord. But you did not abandon them there in the desert, for your mercy is great. You did not take away the cloud of the fire that showed them the path by day and night. In your goodness, you told them what they should do. You fed them with manna and gave them water to drink. Through 40 years in the desert, you provided all that they needed. Their clothing never wore out and their feet were never swollen with pain. You let them conquer nations and kingdoms, lands that bordered their own. They conquered the land of Heshbon, where Sion ruled, and the land of Bashan, where where Og was king. Wow. So they knew the story pretty well, didn't they? Mm-hmm. And this this is unique to me. Mm-hmm. Do, do, can you think about any other time that they made a public corporate confession and commitment? Well, the wonderful Good. summary. Yeah. Beautiful. Wonderful summary Beautiful. of what God had done for them yes. through the years. Yes. It's interesting really to notice the, the other prayer in the Bible that sort of goes like this a little bit. Actually, it's a, it's a sermon is Acts 7, Stephen's prayer. And he said, you Jewish leaders, look, bang, 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 bang. And what did they do? 
instead of repenting, what they do? They took Stephen out and stoned him. him. But this is a corporate, though. This is everyone, and Stephen was kind of one guy alone, kind of thing, Mm -hmm. and they killed him. Wow. This was Nehemiah, wasn't it? Nehemiah, right. Well, this is it's recorded in Nehemiah. I mean, you're asking who did it? Yeah. This is a prayer of the people. The people. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, this it says they th- this all of these is, people that they listed. Yeah, they they stood up. I don't know whether they part of them prayed and then another part. I don't know, but it says these people prayed, and we're going to read that in a moment. We're going to see where it says all the people agreed but to the prayer. Nehemiah was the leader, though. Nehemiah and Ezra. Ezra, right? Yeah. Zerubbabel. I think they were all. Well, it looks to be sixteen or so people. Yeah, we're all taking turns reading a section of that. They this must is have a decided prayer. ahead of time. I don't know. Wrote it all out. It was very planned then. Yeah. I don't know. But some thought went into that to Absolutely. itemize everything. Because we're talking about a thousand years before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's not and handful. Before. I think it's even if there were 5% or 3%, there were quite a few people there yeah. gathered. Yeah. Well, God himself descended on Mount Sinai to speak to yes. them, giving them God, good laws and sound teachings. Then he gave them that special day as a memorial and a time of fellowship. But despite all that God had done for them, they rebelled against him. He fed them and cared for them for 40 years in the wilderness. I mean, imagine if you were born. I I, I wonder this. I ask myself, imagine you're born somewhere out there in the wilderness, and the only food you've ever known is manna, manna. and all of a sudden the manna's gone. Yeah. How would you respond to a complete change in your diet? Yeah, well, what would I eat? <laughs> <laughs> well, and they learned that whatever they, whenever they followed God's directions exactly, the results were miraculous. I mean, we've talked about this, I don't know, but you read through the Bible in the Old Testament, and every time when there was a war of some kind, if they carefully followed and did exactly the way God told them to do, what happened? It won. Often they would come back without losing a single soldier. When they went out on their own, what happened? They lost. You know, after a while you think, hmm, let's see. Is there a pattern here? (laughs) The results were disastrous when they went on their own. So what should we learn from those experiences? Be careful who you have for your leaders. Yeah. God blessed them unbelievably. Why do you think they responded with pride, stubbornness, and disregard of God's gracious acts toward them? How many times has God had to start over by finding some person or group that were that were or are willing to work with him? Think of Adam, Noah, Abraham, the Hebrews, the returnees from Babylon in exile, Jesus, the Christian church, the Protestant movement, and well, hopefully without sounding too proud, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Is it really possible that we will be the last group? What are we doing or what are we going to do that others have failed to do? Well, I would say one thing. In terms of material available, in guidance and so forth like this, we have the Bible, all of it, in all kinds of languages. We can read it in our favorite language, favorite translation, and all the writings of Ellen White. There is never any generation ahead of us that has had the amount of material inspired material available to them that we have not even close yes Jackie just want to say it was not information that they lacked no no I'm not I'm not yeah, arguing about that it's just but I think when you say is it really possible that we will be the last group I firmly believe that we will be the last group because as defective as the church is, Owen White says, it will go through to the end. We yeah. find a lot of people want to find fault with yeah. the organized Seventh-day Adventist church. That isn't what saves us anyway. It's our personal relationship. But the organized Seventh-day Adventist church has the best picture, yeah. the greater picture, the yeah. great controversy, yeah. uh, the way things really are. That's right. The unseen world is That's in reality. Why, as you look back over... Of all of us here, we don't have time to recount this now, but think back over what you know about the history of the Adventist Church, or if you like, the history of your own family or your personal experience. Is there anything in that that might remind you of what's happened, what happened in Nehemiah's day? 
No, what you brought out, you see, it must give us pause. We love this movement. We don't live this movement. Mm -hmm. There are flaws. There, there, there are leaders all over. That Everyone, are, leaders included, see, are human. Yes, it doesn't Make matter. Mistakes. Right, yep. right. It's right. all on our face, but you get up yeah. and set your sail and keep going yes. forward. Yes, amen. God has given us unbelievable blessings. He's so generous. And what he does for us if we're faithful is just beyond belief. There's nothing we can do, however, to earn our salvation. That salvation has already been won by the life and death of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Jim, That's I think you have some comments about message. that. When through repentance and faith we accept Christ as our Savior, the Lord pardons our sins and remits the penalty prescribed for the transgression of the law. The sinner then stands before God as a person he is taken into favor with heaven and through the Spirit his fellowship with the Father and the Son. You, you, you missed one word. Has in fellowship. The sinner then stands before God as a just, just person. person. What did I say? I you know. skipped the just. Oh, okay. Go ahead. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. If we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims to blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will. That, when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience to an appreciation... Excuse me. Yeah. yeah. Through an appreciation appreciation of character of Christ through communion with God sin will become hateful to us. Desire of Ages 668. Now how do you suppose that happens? Communion with God. If we the more we study the life of Jesus particularly yes. but all of the Bible but especially the life of Jesus and we, we, we think about what sin did to him we should come to the place where we just hate sin. There's one thing in the world that everybody's permitted to hate, and that's sin. I don't want to hate well, we others. Can, every day, in our everyday lives, we can see what sin does to people. Exactly. You, of course, but not me. No, I'm just kidding. No, but, <laughs> no, but you're well, right. You're yeah, absolutely right. In our right. everyday lives, yeah. we can exactly. see what sin does to people. Right. You, you, can read, you can see it on the news. You can, we can see it in our own individual lives. Right. Every and it's sin that pays its wage, not God. Yeah, and I, I, I you know, I deal with. I have a, quite a number of elderly patients that are that are patients of mine at the clinic, and you watch them do crazy things, and then you watch them die. Yeah. Hmm. And King David says, and he in his law he meditates day yeah. and night, see to dwell on the. So how do we respond when our sins are pointed out? Maybe by reading something in the Bible or spirit of prophecy or even by something we hear at church? Do we humbly confess and repent or do we rise up in rebellion? The Israelites had records to show that their ancestors had rebelled against God so many times. And always God came back, took them back. Can you think of times in your own life when you rebelled against God? And then hopefully before long you recognize that God was still appealing to you to be his friends. Well, the next part of the pair. You gave them as many children as there are stars in the sky. This is Nehemiah 9 starting with verse 23. And let them conquer and live in the land that, that you had promised their ancestors to give them. They conquered the land of Canaan. You overcame the people living there. You gave your people the power to do as they pleased with the people and kings of Canaan. Your people captured fortified cities, fertile land, houses full of wealth, cisterns already dug, olive trees, fruit trees, vineyards. They ate all they wanted and grew fat. They enjoyed all the good things you gave them. And this is not just a lecture about nutrition. Mm -hmm. But your people rebelled and disobeyed you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed the prophets who warned them, who told them to turn back to you. They insulted you time after time. So you let their enemies conquer and rule them. In their trouble they called to you for help, and you answered them from heaven. Amen. In your great mercy you sent their leaders, sent them leaders who rescued them from their foes. 
When peace returned, they sinned again. And again, you let them, their enemies conquer them. You, yet when they repented and asked, him, he asked you to save them, and haven't you heard? And time after time, you rescued them in your great mercy. This is another verse that clearly explains God's wrath. What does God do? When we sin against him and we keep rebelling, getting further and further away from them, finally, what does he do? He lets us go and reap the consequences of our own behavior. Mm-hmm. You warned them to obey your teachings. But in pride they rejected your laws. And although keeping your law is the way to life, obstinate and stubborn, they refused to obey. Year after year you patiently warned them. You inspired your prophets to speak, but your people were deaf. So they let them be conquered by other so you let them be conquered by other nations, and yet, because your mercy is great, you did not forsake or destroy them. You are a gracious and merciful God. Mm. Wow. Amen. Mm. Once again, they continued in their discussion of the blessings of God in contrast to the the response of their ancestors, saying, They ate all they wanted and grew fat. They enjoyed all the good things you gave them, Nehemiah 9.25. So, why is it so easy to enjoy, to rejoice in God's gifts and at the same time forget the giver? We're in it for the loaves and fishes. That's kind of what happens. The temporal blessings as opposed to the Things that are the things that are seen, rather than the things that are unseen, eternal in the heavens. You remind us, of course, of the experience of Jesus with feeding the loaves and the fishes out there. Yeah. I like to think about the people who did, who did, who went there that day, and the relatives came home. You know, normally you would go out. And it says you'd leave in the morning. You say, "I'm going to go find Jesus," and you'd leave with a small lunch or something, and you'd come, and you would expect they would come home what hungry. Right? You would expect them to come home hungry. They come home carrying a few loaves and a few fishes, and they say, try these. Yeah. (laughs) And you would say, what would you say? Where did you get this food? And then, of course, they would tell the story. I just, I mean, what's he doing? He's, 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 He's teaching, practicing, giving practice to a whole lot of evangelists. They're telling what? They're telling the good news, right? Marvelous. So when the Bible talks about growing fat, it is not just speaking about nutrition. There are only three places in the Bible where this particular expression is used. Here in Nehemiah 9.25, also in Deuteronomy 3.2.15 and Jeremiah 5.28. In each case, it has a very negative connotation. Why do you think that is? Well, I think Proverbs 37 kind of unpacks it a little bit. Two things I ask of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Neither Give me neither pro- poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I, will, that I not be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Yeah. Or that I not be in want and steal and profane uh, the name of my God. Very good. If, if Proverbs were, is written by Solomon, it's kind of just not... Well, actually, this well. <laughs> chapter 30 says the words of Agar. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. anyway. Yeah. He was a compiler. He was a compiler. Yeah. yeah. A lot of Egyptian stuff in there. Too. Do we always praise God and appreciate Him for all His gifts to us? Mm-hmm. How often in church do we have special sessions for praising God for what He's done? I don't think we do it enough. I don't think you need to word be concerned about that. Well, you, if you just listen and take his instruction, that's that's the greatest way to honor him. Not, not yeah. do with his lips and singing and waving yeah. your arms. Well, we we should. Yeah, no, I, I I agree with that. But there's there's a place, an appropriate place for a church to praise God for what He's done for us. I mean, after we talk about, I mean, experience like this. If if someone would stand up and say, "Look, this is what happened," da da da. And we would say, Amen, you know, time to praise God. Jim, so uh, shouldn't our personal worship be as vibrant, if not more, in the closet than what happens in the corporate worship? I prefer what you just said. It makes most, a very good sense to me. I, I, I always think of David 
when he was dancing. Yeah, that, that wasn't an advocation. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that God endorsed it. Yeah. <laughs> dancing or dancing right? naked? I, I don't think... I, I, well, I don't I'd remember be, him being naked. I just remember oh, him praising what... God and his wife yeah. being... Yeah. False daughter. ...hating him for it. So there... But God loved his exuberance. Yeah. And his thankful heart. But does it have any stay in power? That's that's really what we want, we want to measure. It by. Why doesn't the Excitement. multitude? Yeah. Why doesn't the multitude of God's gifts lead us to a closer walk with Him? Why do we tend to focus on the gifts and while enjoying them, seem to forget the giver? What a fatal deception! That's not to suggest that God does not want us to be happy and rejoice and be thankful for the gifts. He wants us to be happy. Let us not allow our enjoyment of these gifts to become a stumbling block in our relationship with God himself. A careful review of God's dealings with the children of Israel down through the generations reveals two major important issues. One, Israel cast God's law away. And two, they persecuted God's prophets. Are we gradually casting away our end-time prophet, Ellen White? Making him none effect. Mm -hmm. Spirit of prophecy, you mean? Uh, how many people, how, yeah. uh, how many young people even know that there's a book called Great Controversy? Yeah. <laughs> Much less read it. Much less yeah. read it. Well, yeah, right. Desire of Ages, too. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Marvelous yes. books we have. Yeah, Marvelous books. Great blessings, but yes. it Me. doesn't seem to be something right. they're interested in. Yeah. It's an unusual young person that spends his time looking at Spirit of Prophecy. Those books were read by one of the early president of Harvard University and he thought well, they were one of the best books ever written. Mm. And Nehemiah's... Yeah, it's interesting to me that uh, if she had said she was infallible, oh. people would have jumped all over her. Uh, and of course she said never claimed it. She said no, I, you know. But because they find something wrong or they think it's wrong, then they condemn her for that. So yeah. you... <laughs> There's an expression for that, but I won't <laughs> use it. Yeah. I, I thank God for Advent Hope. Yeah. yeah. Really, truly, I Advent, thank God. Uh, uh, leaders in education of this country that weren't Adventists that read Mrs. Weiss' books about yeah. education and were dumbfounded by it. Yeah. In Nehemiah's day, they realized that God's law and his prophets were essential to their development. And as a godly nation and as individuals, God intends for us to live by following his laws for our lives. Nehemiah 9.27, Leviticus 18.5. So we come to the next section of the prayer. Our God, O oh God, our God, how great you are, how terrifying, how powerful. You're, you faithfully keep your covenant promises from the time when Assyrian kings oppressed us even till now, how much we have suffered. Our kings, our leaders, our priests and prophets, our ancestors and all our people have suffered. Remember how much we have suffered. You have done right to punish us. You have been faithful even though we have sinned. Our ancestors, our kings, leaders, and priests have not kept your law. They did not listen to your commands and warnings. With your blessing, kings ruled your people. When they lived in the broad, fertile land, you gave them. But they failed to turn from sin and serve you. And now we are slaves in the land that you gave us. This fertile land which gives us food. What the land produces goes to the kings that you put over us because we sinned. They do as they please with us and our livestock and we are in deep distress. Because of all that has happened, we the people of Israel hereby make a solemn written agreement and our leaders, our Levites and our priests put their seals to it. Mm. Wow. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Once again, the people's prayer turned back to honoring God for the great things that he had done. Then they recalled the times of trouble they had been through from time, from time they were overcome by the Assyrians down to their time. And Charles, I think you have a couple of comments there. Sure. You have done right to punish us. You have been faithful even though we have sinned. Nehemiah 3 and 9 verse 33. Then go to Deuteronomy um, 18. 17. 17. 18, 18. through 20. When he becomes 
key. Now these are instructions. This yes. is back. We're going back. We suddenly All leaping right. back a thousand years, yes. and we're getting instructions that Moses gave to them about what their king should do when when they chose a king. This when is what they the chose king a was. King, the the original plan was not for them to have a king. Yeah. So when he becomes king, he is to he is to have a copy of the book of God's law and teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. This will keep him from thinking that he is better than his fellow Israelites and from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way they have then then he will reign for many years and his descendants will rule Israel for many generations how different would the story of the children of Israel have been if they had they and their kings had followed those instructions so what are the implications of the fact that the children of Israel at that time made a solemn covenant agreement and had it writ read, written, and sealed by their leaders, saying that they would obey and follow God? Follow God? As, we will see late, as we will see later, that covenant or agreement with God is described in detail in Nehemiah 10. In the final section of Nehemiah 9, we note with interest that they called themselves servants or slaves. They were in great distress. Nehemiah 9.37 and they reminded God that this paralleled the position and experience of the children of Israel while they were still slaves in Egypt. Finally they appealed once again to God's grace and mercy not because of anything they had done or, of their, or their ancestors had done asking for the Lord's intervention on their behalf. And we are reminded of Romans 5 6-8 for when we were still helpless Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may even be that someone might dare to die for a good person. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. Wow. Well, we've already noticed that they enjoyed all the good things in verse 25 that you gave them. This expression, you, they enjoyed themselves, comes from the same root as the name Eden, in the Garden of Eden. In other words, they Edenized themselves. Mm -hmm. Think of how Adam and Eve must have enjoyed themselves in the Garden, but unfortunately, Edomized, Edenized, is not a verb. God's original plan for the children of Israel was for them to occupy the crossroads of the civilized world of those days. They were to carry the good news about God to all corners of that world, creating the closest reflection on, of Eden that would be possible on this earth. Once again, we, we remind ourselves that it's not wrong to delight ourselves or enjoy God's gifts. The sin is forgetting who gave us those gifts. What was Jesus talking about when he, when he mentioned this deceitfulness of riches in Matthew thirteen twenty two? What does that have to do with this prayer from the children of Israel? It's very easy for a person to be consumed by the love of money, 1 Timothy six ten. Often those who have more of it are consumed even more by it. Recognizing God as our creator is a first step and recognize how dependent we are on him. If he could not create us, if he had not created us in our environment like the Garden of Eden in the beginning, how could we be sure that he could recreate us and restore the Garden of Eden to us in the end? In this lesson we have discussed corporate repentance. The children of Israel gathered together and repented of the sins done by their ancestors. Two biblical scholars, Robert Wheeland and Donald Short, made an intensive study of what happened at the 1880 General Conference Session in Minneapolis in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the book that they later produced about that experience, they suggested that the Adventist Church will not succeed in its mission until we corporately repent of the mistakes we made in 1888. Has that been done? Uh, uh, do, mm -hmm. I ha do I need to answer that question? <laughs> no. The people, and if you want, if you out there want to know what we're talking about, look at First Selected Messages, page 233 to 235. The people recognized that they were not welcome back in their own 
territory, their own land that God had given them by the people of the surrounding nations. They had endured persecution and slavery. They had been working hard trying to rebuild their beloved city. I mean, think of what they did just to rebuild the wall. Then they asked God to intervene, to act, to see and hear, and to respond. They appealed to God from that time forward to be with them and to prevent them from falling back into those old sins. But as we will learn, some of them quickly fell back into some of the same sins that their fathers had committed. The prophet Ezekiel tells of a time when at least in prophetic imagery God departed from Jerusalem. You can read about that in Ezekiel 5, 11, 8, 6, and then the later chapters in Ezekiel. How do these verses compare with Matthew 23, 37, and 38? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, does these words sound familiar? Mm -hmm. You kill the prophets and stone the messengers God has sent you. How many times have I wanted to put my arms around all of your people just as a hen gathers your chicks under her wings, but you would not let me. And so your temple will be abandoned and empty. From now on I tell you, you will never see me again until you say, God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, even though God left the devastated city of Jerusalem and followed his people to Babylon and then to Medo-Persia, he came back with them in a special sense and told them to call the new city, The Lord is here, Ezekiel 48:35. Are we prepared to have that kind of a relationship with God? Yeah. Are we, prepared to, are we prepared to admit our sins, not only our individual sins, but our corporate sins? Has the time come for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to repent corporately? Why does God pursue His children so relentlessly? Because He loves them. How can I give you yeah. up? Yeah. How can I let you go? How can I let you It go? is because He wants to be close to us. Imagine the God of the universe wants to be close to every single one of us. He wants that kind of a relationship. What might happen if we determined to confess our sins as Israel did in Nehemiah's day? Can you imagine what a church service would be like if we tried to do that? Would God come down in the form of the Holy Spirit to guide us to the finish of the, of the gospel if we did that? What if, I'm, I'm good. What if something unique happened during yeah. the general conference? Session? Yeah, exactly. Well, we're going to throw that question to you because our time is up. We want you to think about it because it's a very important question. Our kind and wonderful Father, we, we bow now before you, thanking for these words of inspiration, of challenge. We wonder what would happen if we as a church, corporately, all turned our hearts to you and really in earnest desire said, God, we want to be like you. We want to have you as our guide to show us the way to become more like Jesus. What a marvelous experience that would be. And very soon, I'm sure, it would lead us into the kingdom of heaven. May that be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.